Good afternoon and welcome to the Results Be Ready 10 Steps to Preparedness webinar series. My name is Allison Albright and I'm the Regional Preparedness Liaison for FEMA Region 2. I'm going to provide a few technical considerations before we begin. Today's proceedings are being recorded and captioned. The archived event will be available on the FEMA website in the coming weeks. You can hear audio through your computer speakers, so please ensure your volume is turned up so you may hear the proceedings accordingly. In the top right of the screen, you asked to like, if you'd like to receive news and updates from Region 2. If so, please enter your email address and we'll be sure to add you to the distribution list. We will have a question and answer session after the presentation concludes. You'll see a Q&A pod in the lower right-hand corner. Please feel free to submit your questions about the subject matter there and time permitting, we'll do our best to answer them. Finally, the PowerPoint presentation from today will be available for you to download in the file share pod as a PDF. You click on the file and download it using the download button. That, I'll turn it over to the Region 2 Community Preparedness Officer to introduce our speakers and today's proceedings. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Debbie Casa, the Community Preparedness Officer for FEMA Region 2. I'd like to again welcome you to our Resolve to be Ready 10 Steps to Preparedness webinar series. FEMA's individual and community preparedness programs from around the nation have come together as one FEMA to collaborate on a series of preparedness webinars for our stakeholders. Resolve to be Ready is focused on sharing emerging trends and resources from across the country. Each session will feature FEMA preparedness staff from the different regional offices, and we're pleased to be co-hosting today's webinar with the individual and community preparedness team from FEMA's Region 9 office serving Arizona, California, Hawaii, Nevada, Guam, American Samoa, Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands, Republic of Marshall Islands, and the Federated States of Micronesia. This webinar will focus on innovative and culturally inclusive programs that help prepare and train non-English speaking community members in disaster preparedness. Programs like LISTOS are excellent examples of our shared desire to more fully serve our communities at large. Our first speaker today is Liliana Encina. She currently serves as the Fire Service Training Institute at FSTI National Program Director and the Bilingual English-Spanish Public Outreach Coordinator for Santa Barbara City Fire Department in California. She works for and with the Latino community by providing outreach, social work, program outreach, and engagement practices in emergency public education and information for the state of California's vulnerable populations. She has served as the Director of Family Services at La Casa de la Raza um, Cesar E. Chavez Center and at the Latino Initiatives and Outreach Coordinator for the County of Santa Barbara Office of Emergency Manager Management since she emigrated from Mexico to the U.S. She is a state certified Spanish English interpreter and translator and a certified state cert master trainer. In her spare time, she volunteers at different capacities with community based organizations. Our second speaker today, and I just lost my script, so you'll have to forgive me for a second, uh, is Karen Baker. And Karen is a nationally recognized leader, strategist, and community problem solver, currently works to address California's most pressing issues by leveraging service, partnerships, and innovative program design. Having held cabinet posts under three governors, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jerry Brown, and Gavin Newsom, Karen has built efforts that continue to show great impact to this day. She was tapped by Governor Newsom as the architect and co-chair of Listos California campaign, focusing on building a people-centered disaster preparedness campaign that has already reached one out of every four vulnerable and diverse Californians. Karen also serves as senior advisor in the California governor's nonprofits in the homeless, homelessness and poverty arenas as well as served on the team that created AmeriCorps during the Clinton administration. With that, I'd like to turn the mic and camera over to Liliana to get us started. Thank you so much. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Liliana, um, can you start your webcam? Yes, give me one second. I don't think I 
turned on the right button. Yeah, you okay. got it. There we are. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Liliana Encinas, and I'm the National Listos Director. And today, I'm going to be speaking about the Aware and Prepare Listos Program, which is a disaster preparedness education for vulnerable populations. And so please feel free to utilize the chat box. Uh, with any questions or any comments, we do have our Aware and Prepare executive team and our LISPO staff members available to answer any of your questions. And so, um, let me see, can I move on? There we go. Okay, so what is LISPOS? And this question, um, I guess, is, is kind of like the, the question we need to get I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties with the presentation. Let me see. Which slide do you need to be on, Liliana? I, on the second, on the second one. I'm trying to. Ah. Oh my. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So um, there are uh, culturally competent disaster preparedness curriculum. And we really like to see ourselves as a, a community capacity building curriculum. We see it as a stepping stone for the community emergency response teams, the CERT. Um, and we're a very adaptable, flexible, and tailored curriculum for the communities we're trying to reach. We're very low tech and we're mobile. We do not utilize PowerPoint presentations or anything that will um, intervene in our teaching uh, methods, and so very low tech. Uh, there we go. So the, a, a little bit of history on LISOS is there was very uh, little preparedness messaging offered to the Spanish-speaking community when we started, and so we were developed in 2009 and it was uh, the result of a roundtable discussion that we had with community leaders, with community-based organizations that worked with Spanish-speaking populations and uh, wanted to uh, have a, a, a better communication with the population. We are the result of the Aware and Prepare Initiative, which is a public-private partnership here in Santa Barbara County uh, that we, uh, we were able to utilize uh, to precisely implement the, the LISOS program. Okay. And so we, as I mentioned, we were, we cre we were created as, a, as that county-wide public-private partnership, right, specifically to uh, Santa Barbara County here in California to strengthen that disaster readiness and to build a, a resilient community. And so we uh, wanted to address the gaps that were in disaster readiness um, in regards to education, to outreach, and even messaging uh, with Spanish-speaking populations. So as the years went by, we, we, we first created a pilot program in 2010 in a small city here in Santa Barbara County, Carpinteria, that was very successful, which then led to uh, revising a curriculum, creating a train-the-trainer model so we could uh, create sustainability, right, and, and build leadership amongst the folks that were going through the basic program. And then in 2014, we were able to start sharing outside of Santa Barbara County because we were getting multiple requests of uh, this program being in this county and being so successful. Okay. So, um, the model for creating the LISOS program was really incorporating the best practices that, uh, that we, we saw in other programs. For example, the Promotores de Salud program, which is the health promoters uh, program that is peer-to-peer uh, -peer teaching on, um, on health and, and, and other um, just general well-being. Uh, on the Community Emergency Response Team curriculum and other types of Spanish-speaking outreach programs that were successful. LISOS uh, provides the information uh, of disaster, the importance of disaster readiness, right? But we do it in a very basic form. 
it's really non-threatening, it's non-overwhelming, it's a very simple approach to start that disaster preparedness conversation. And we encourage all family members to partake in the class activity. So it really includes a multi-generation, multilingual household in these preparedness efforts. We emphasize on targeted recruitment, and our presentations are really tailored to the specific cultural and linguistic needs of the population we wish to serve. Our curriculum was created in Spanish. It is not a translation of, of any curriculum. It was created with these cultural sensitivities in mind. And um, we, we, as you can see here in, in the picture, uh, it's a very uh, visually engaging program. We want to encourage conversation. We want to the participants to share their skill sets and really engage with them at that level. Our curriculum is an eight-hour curriculum, and so this curriculum includes the following topics, like we talk about, you know, knowing your risks, document backup, we talk about fire extinguisher, anything that has to do with really starting that preparedness in your home. We ideally divide the curriculum into four sessions in which we cover these specific topics and we practice activities uh, according to the topic. Um, there's different models of doing this. Some, some programs wish to do a one-day, eight-hour course. Other programs wish to do uh, four sessions of uh, two hours or whatever the community's needs are, uh, we're flexible to that. But we all know that due to COVID, we all had to do some modifications and adjust to uh, what we're living now. And so we do offer virtual education options. Um, we're not conducting any in-person training right now due to COVID, but we do have interactive ways of uh, teaching LISO. So we use platforms such as Zoom, and we conduct training uh, in two hours, uh, two sessions of two hours, where we have instructors available and ready to teach. We also encourage the whole family to participate, even though it's behind that screen, they still practice, they still uh, do all of the activities. Of course, it's not the same as doing it in person, but it's something that we had to adapt to. We also offer pre-recorded sessions, which are shorter in, in time frame, but those are also available through Zoom for those participants that uh, don't have that time commitment and, and would like to do it this way. And we also have introductory courses that are about 15 minutes uh, long that people can, can look at and see what LISO is, is all about. Along with our curriculum, we do have a YouTube channel where we, we are strong believer, believers of visually te teaching folks, right? So we have these short videos in which we cover specific topics to the curriculum that are available in English and Spanish, and it's different preparedness topics um, that we cover within our curriculum. So you can always visit our website at listos.awareandprepared.us or you can visit our YouTube channel, which is Alertar y Preparar Listos, which is the word prepare but in Spanish, and these videos can be found there as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why it works. So I get this question a lot, and they say, well, why, why is it different than other programs out there? It, it works because we utilize the strengths in the community. We really try to empower families and the, the entire household to take care of themselves. Uh, we bring uh, other community resources that are very crucial in, in disaster preparedness because they need to know what is within their local community, and that's going to create a more resilient community. We uh, create the, the curriculum with the target community in mind. So we believe in oral discussions, uh, in, in that information sharing, and how people uh, are going to be open to share or to receive this new information. And again, we try to do it non-overwhelming, non-threatening, in a very basic form. Uh, we partner with established community and trusted leaders. And so we, we're, we 
strongly believe that this is a community builder. And so we, we work along with um, food banks, with school districts, with resource centers, libraries, places of worship, and places where there's already captive, captive audiences and there's already a trust with that community. So we just add on that preparedness component. Some of the key lessons that we've learned throughout this decade that we've been uh, teaching the LISOS program is that we really need to meet folks where they are. We can't expect them to come and, and want to learn on preparedness when it's probably a new subject um, altogether. So we really want to make sure that we meet them and not only uh, meet them where they're all, where they are perhaps emotionally or mentally or but physically as well because we know that could be an impediment too. So we go to neighborhoods, we go to mobile home parks, we go to agricultural fields, we go to food banks as I, as I mentioned, we have these partners so we are making sure we're meeting them there. We welcome children so we, we have classes where the entire family participates and of course it's about the food. When we share meals something magical happens when you start sharing um, your experiences or your concerns or whatever it is, but it, it starts that sharing. So we do potlucks and we believe in all of this and really building community. And so those are some of the, the key lessons that we do have. Uh, we have to keep in mind that um, we, we have to commit, right, to assist everyone if we really want to build a resilient community. Remember that inclusiveness is uh, not just a box that we check, right? That we're, oh, we're delivering it in Spanish language or this language or that language. It really has to be a commitment. And um, and we have to be inclusive of everyone. And so um, something that I wanted to share is, you know, populations uh, were close to inequity. Just this last year, we saw a lot that we hadn't seen before. And so this goes way longer than just a, a particular one particular disaster, right? This is not just to the pandemic, but this is something that's there. And we have to make sure we address it and that we're open to, right, working with our communities. We have to be adaptable, flexible, and, and tailor whatever our message is to the community we want to reach. And we have to keep these relationships going. Uh, sometimes it's easy for us to put something together, but we have to think of a plan on how we're going to continue building these relationships and, and, and building that trust with our community. And of course, uh, I can say LISOS is absolutely fabulous, but there are, are challenges as with any curriculum. And we do understand that perhaps recruitment, attendance, uh, you know, that storytelling and even measuring the successes could be challenges. But I see that there's more successes than there are challenges with LISOS. Um, and and we re that's when that flexibility and that adaptability play a huge role because that's how you're going to overcome these challenges. Um, and, and as well as uh, we're not going to learn about inclusiveness and, and, you know, building community in a 20-minute PowerPoint presentation on LISOS, right? Uh, this is much more than that. And so each community is different, and we have to make sure that we know our community. We know what they need and how we can serve them, meet them where they're at. And it takes a lot of work. It's not, it's not easy, right? And it's more than a year of campaigning. It's more than just uh, introducing the idea. It really is fostering that, that whole educational uh, approach of how can you prepare and how can you keep this going, right? Some of the unanticipated outcomes that we've had is that we we have a large participation from uh, the communities that we want to uh, reach. We see that uh, the graduations, the ceremonies, the certificates, and still a lot of pride in, in this particular community. It really empowers them. And something that we have seen throughout all of our LISOS classes is that it um, it really creates that culture of preparedness. It's, it's a multi-generational, multilingual household of being introduced 
to emergency disaster information and linking them with their local resources, with their first responders, getting them comfortable with people in uniform that are there to serve a purpose, right? We do offer a train-to-trainer -train curriculum because we do believe that the program, in order to be sustainable, we have to create leadership. And so we have the train-to-trainer -train curriculum, which is a 24-hour curriculum. Currently, right now, due to COVID, it's also being modified, and we do it in, in, in a 16-hour uh, curriculum uh, through the Zoom platform as well to create uh, that leadership. And um, and it's a, it's a great curriculum. It, it gives the participants more information on how to be leaders in disaster preparedness education in their local community. The way that we evaluate the program is we have weekly assignments. We do have uh, surveys. We have evaluations. So you can see how the program is being successful in your community. And of course, the, the participants' willingness to share uh, some of our community like to share and, and promote the program on their own, and that's how we can see if the program is being successful. And as I mentioned before, that empowerment, right? Knowledge is strength, and uh, it really is that confidence and trust uh, to access the community resources uh, in the need of, if there's a need in the disaster, right? It changes lives, they have seen it, and it builds relationship. Uh, my other hat that I wear, uh, other than these two directors, I work for a local fire department. And I have seen the difference uh, when we have fires. California is, is very familiar to fires. So in the evacuations, in uh, receiving the messaging, in understanding what a, uh, um, a warning is, what an alert is, what a flash flood warning is, in all of these terms, really the community knowing what they are makes a huge difference um, with the eye, in, in the eyes of a, of a first responder. What's happening now with our program is we have 58 registered programs in the state of California. Uh, thanks to the California for All grant, uh, the initiative, uh, we received grants. We were able to translate uh, the program into 11 other languages. And some of those languages other than Spanish and English is we have Japanese, we have Vietnamese, Korean, traditional Chinese, Hebrew, Russian, French, Portuguese, uh, among other uh, languages in which the program is available. We have a new design and a curriculum update. As I mentioned, we do have a manual um, that we use as a resource, as a guide uh, for our curriculum. But this is much more than that manual. It's much more than that curriculum. It's that building that community, linking them to local resources. That's that's where the beauty of these folks is. Some of the uh, uh, procedures to start a program in your community uh, are, it, it, it's fairly easy to start a program, but we do like for these programs to be linked in some way with their offices of emergency services, their fire departments, their law enforcement. We want them to know uh, the resources that are available. Um, there has, it has to be consistency, sustainability, continuity, right? This is all important to deliver, the, to, to have a program, a robust program. There's minimal to no cost uh, uh, for training and for implementation uh, and no cost to participants. Uh, the program is built on volunteer leadership and engagement. And so we do uh, 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 support programs with sustainability and with tools for them to, to have a robust registered program. The process, uh, we, we ask that they have a sponsoring agency. And so, I, as I mentioned, either that agency can be a local fire department, a police department, an office of emergency services, and on a case-by-case -case basis, yes, a non-governmental agency uh, can be a sponsoring agency. Here's some examples of our outreach materials. Uh, we have outreach materials that are specific to um, whatever the disaster is in that community. So we want to get them familiar with the terminology, with the words, with warnings, with uh, alerts, whatever it is that we use, even their uh, communication system for alerts in that 
area. So we do have these outreach materials also available. Here's some more of our outreach, outreach material. And so we have a very robust curriculum that includes all of this with these specific topics. Uh, and this is, this is uh, important for the communities and for emergency managers as well, because um, since we are committed, right, to uh, nurturing these relationships, we have to make sure that we're, that we're linguistically appropriate and culturally relevant to, um, to these communities so that preparedness, uh, those preparedness efforts are ongoing. And as I mentioned before, right, we, we believe in multi-generational, uh, uh, multilingual uh, capacity. So we want to build sustainability, and we have instructor development uh, courses as well. For more information, you can uh, reach us at uh, listos.awarepair.us or cfalistos.org. And uh, thank you for listening. If you have any questions or any comments that weren't addressed, we're happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Deborah, should I go ahead and get started, or did you want to take a break for some questions? No, we're going to hold the questions to the end. Go ahead, Tara. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Well, um, hello, my name is Taryn Baker. I'm with Listos California, which is an emergency preparedness campaign here in the state of California. Um, it's a $50 million um, funded campaign that was provided funds in the um, beginning of 2019 uh, to fund what was going to be an 18-month campaign aimed at educating a million of our most diverse and vulnerable Californians to prepare them for natural disasters. That was the focus of the effort. Um, obviously, about uh, a year into it, um, all of a sudden COVID hit. So the campaign ended up expanding to also include uh, COVID-19. And um, so what I'd like to be able to do is give you a quick overview of this effort. Um, and our focus and strategies, and then um, obviously provide you the free and very easily accessible materials that we developed so that if it can help you in your community, I hope you'll just, you know, please copy all materials <laughs> and, and edit uh, as, as you see fit. Um, that's me. Um, I want to begin um, with how this all started. In, in January 2019, our Governor Gavin Newsom had traveled to the campfire in paradise and was just really struck by how diverse and vulnerable people were really um, hit quite hard by fires, as they always are in most disasters. And um, diverse and vulnerable people, for purposes of our campaign, are defined as those people that are older Californians, people with disabilities, people that are low income, and non-English speakers, and other diverse communities members. So, the idea was, why don't we take the $50 million and invest in a couple of different strategies? One, let's provide grants to community-based organizations. Ones like the LISOS program you just heard about is part of our, our, one of our volunteer and service teams that we invested in so that they could expand. Um, others were organizations like the United Way of Fresno who was able to take funds and be able to then spend that, um, those funds on educating their community. So um, the investment ended up uh, eventually ending up with about 300 nonprofits. Um, and those 300 nonprofits are the ones that were really responsible for connecting kind of person to person on the ground in their community with these diverse and vulnerable individuals. And as I mentioned, our goal was to hit a million. We were able to hit with intensive education about 2.4 million people. We still have a couple months to go. And then with some COVID-19 specific material, over 18 million were reached. So uh, we were very excited about, about those results. Now, um, kind of how did we do it? Um, I'll talk about that. Um, First of all, what was really important was having research that really informed our strategies. Um, 
One of the first things we learned by uh, working with EMC out of Oakland was to find out that, you know, people did want to be prepared, but there were three things that were getting in their way. First of all, they found that they were scared. They thought it was um, too time consuming and it was potentially expensive. And so what we realized in, in, in designing the campaign that would really work is we had to address those, those issues. So what you'll see when you go to the lisoscalifornia.org site is you will see um, kind of positive energy, positive uh, displays of uh, people that are empowered to make their families safer. Um, and that is kind of uh, what we learned by getting rid of kind of the scare tactics that so many of us have been using in the preparedness world, but that we found actually prevent people from getting prepared. Um, another thing, obviously, is making it really simple, both uh, being mindful of literacy levels. We wrote most of our materials at a seventh grade literacy level, and then ensuring that we have it in the languages and have the design be culturally um, sensitive as well and appropriate. And so we have it in the seven languages, all of our materials, um, that represent the 24 counties that ended up competing and securing our grants through a competitive process. Um, they speak English, Spanish, Korean, Chinese, Vietnamese, Hmong, and Filipino. So those were our primary seven languages. In addition, as additional partners came on board, we've added Russian, um, Arabic, and other um, languages, especially with some of the more prominent languages for refugees that have come into the state of California. And we really wanted to be able to reach these community members. We've also realized we needed to create both audio files and videos to make sure that we're reaching both Mixteco, Oaxacan communities, in both Mexico as well as Central America that might have oral language traditions and might need materials presented in a different format. Um, so what, what we did in doing this research, it helped really inform what we were going to do. We did an inventory of both FEMA materials, other state and regional and local campaigns to really kind of boil it down to five is what we found would be simple and yet helpful. And the five steps for the California campaign are, first of all, to make sure that you get the alerts that you need, which is you go to calalerts.org. And that would direct you, once you go to CalAlerts, to your specific county that would have its very specific alert and warning system, um, because they are different throughout California. So that's step one. Number two is to make a plan for your people. And that meant uh, to create a connect and protect list, which is a list of all of the people that you're looking out for and that might be looking out for you. And this includes, you know, obviously your phone number, your email, your physical address, and putting that all in a envelope that goes into your go bag. Um, so you have your connect and protect list, your evacuation routes that have been identified. There's tips about that in our disaster ready guide, which I'm, I'm pulling this all from. Um, and then as you, as you put that together and create a plan for your people, then you're ready for step three, which is your go bag. And what we have um, when, once you see our materials is really graphically rich um, materials that make it quite simple for people to see exactly what they need, documents, cash, maps, medication lists, et cetera, that go into that go bag. Makes it really easy to follow. Um, and then step four is to create a stay box for those kinds of disasters where you need to stay exactly where you are. Um, and step five, informing your friends and neighbors about the importance of preparedness. So these five steps are all embodied in uh, a main guide that we created called the Disaster Ready Guide. And um, I'm sharing this, but what you really need to do is go on to the website at lisoscalifornia.org, and that's where you'll see this guide um, available in digital format, and you'll also see it in, of course, all the different languages. If you were to look in this guide, you would see 
there's a lot of attention made to making it, you know, culturally rich. Um, so we're, we're very thrilled with that piece. We also provide on the website 15-minute curriculum, one-hour curriculum, um, all kinds of different ways where you can learn how to communicate um, this information um, in a way that will hopefully work for your community. Um, another thing that we did in the research step to make it relevant to the community that was being educated is we created hazard and vulnerability maps that overlap earthquake, wildfire, and flood risk with various vulnerability categories. So you can find out if you're a senior and um, you think you live in an earthquake zone, you might be able to look at these maps and find out, oh, wow, I'm actually most at risk for a flood, not an earthquake. Um, so these maps have been very helpful in helping to even further target what kind of preparedness campaign a, a very specific zip code would benefit from. Um, all of those maps are available on our website for, for California. Um, another thing that made, I think, our, our campaign or helping to get a, a success were the advisors that we listened to. Not only uh, did we have, of course, our 300 CBOs that represented very diverse communities, but um, advisors from 25 different interests. Um, they would review our materials. They, they helped us produce additional materials. One of the more um, popular and interesting ones was a disaster guide for homeless people. You know, how do we really get our homeless community prepared? Um, we also have guides for the developmentally disabled, um, intellectually disabled, There's disaster guides for farm workers. You'll see all kinds of very tailored guides for these community members, all on the website. So just want to make sure um, you realize our advisors and subject and population experts helped with that. Um, and then, of course, those fabulous CBOs, all of those 2.4 million um, engagements, which ranged from, let's say, a 15-minute engagement from talking to you outside of a grocery store, I'm handing you the disaster guide, we're having a conversation, you're able to ask some questions. Um, that would be considered on a, one end of an engagement. And then we also counted all the way up to people that became least those program participants or CERT volunteers. So that's the 20 hours in the case of CERT, uh, four to six hours in the case of least those. So we had a range of what counted for that 2.4 million. Um, but just wanted to let you know about that. Um, these are those five steps that were the simplified message to really boost preparedness that we created. Um, and these, this is just a sampling of some of the documents um, that we found that we really, really benefited from. We also have a series of uh, magnets that go on the refrigerator in seven different languages with art that really does um, connect with our various communities. We found art as a really primary cultural, you know, connector. Um, these were the numbers um, a few um, a month ago. These have gone up, like I said, to 2.4 million for emergency preparedness engagements and over 18 million through COVID. Um, and this, this is, um, a, provides you with some of our, um, our links on social media. Um, right now on Facebook, we have close to 45,000 followers. Um, just doing great um, on uh, all of our social media platforms. It's, it's been a really big way of connecting with all of the niches of our community that we try to reach. Um, and that was a really another big part of the investment of the 50 million was toward that, that social media asset creation, um, making sure that we also had paid and earned media. Um, it was, it was really important to have what we called the air game and the ground game going on at the same time. Um, my name is here as the architect and co-chair, but I just have to do a shout out to Justin Knighton, my, my co-chair of LISOS, who is also now over at FEMA, serving as the Director of External Affairs. But the two of us were, were the tag team for this effort, working, as I said, with all of these just wonderful community-based programs. Um, and with that, I'm going to just really turn over the rest of my time so we can have more time for questions. 
Um, thank you so very much for the opportunity. Thank you both so much for all this great information. And we do have a, a pretty engaged audience that have uh, quite a few questions for you both. So if, um, if you both want to have your cameras on, then I will put the questions out there and one or the other could determine who's best. Or perhaps maybe you could both add a little insight. Um, so the first question we have is whether or not you have the people that participate actually prepare a go bag for emergencies. You want to take that, Liliana? Sure. Yes. Um, so yes, definitely. Uh, I think both we and and I I forgot to add, uh, but I thank you for to Barbara and our team that was on there. So thanks to to Lisa's California, we're able to reach more uh, population, and we try to align with uh, what the, with the state efforts are. So we we want to have that same messaging to all of our communities. We don't want that mixed messaging. So yes, we do have them build their ready kits. We have them actually write out a family communication and reunification plan as part of the lease source program, as well as knowing where their utilities are. We actually do a walkthrough through the area, involve all the, the family or uh, the household members uh, to identify the risks and, and, and things of this sort. So yes, we definitely do that. And uh, in our program, the, the community-based organizations were given a budget where they could decide what items they would, were interested in purchasing to help really promote a program. We sent all of them um, these go bags that were really, you know, a simple drawstring bag, as well as document holders um, that were made available to them for um, preparedness documents that we thought were really important. Um, so that would go out to all of the community-based organizations as materials um, should they choose to use them for their kind of education approach. One of the things I will say is we gave flexibility to those community-based organizations. There are some people that really wanted to approach it um, in a very specific way. Maybe they were educating people with disabilities and had to have a lot more details uh, kind of attended to a lot more hints and tips um, than someone else. And so we really respected the fact that their knowledge of their community, both geographically as well as the makeup of their community, might lead them down a different path on how best to prepare them. We just provided the state-produced materials as a resource, right? And then it was up to them to spend the grant that they had in whatever way they saw fit. Thank you both. Liliana, does uh, LISOS provide the programs directly to the community, or does it have programs to instruct representatives from partner agencies um, on leading the program? Well, I think it's a bit of both. Um, we do we deliver it to all the communities, but that's why we uh, we ask that you have a sponsoring agency to make sure that your uh, emergency responders, that your offices of emergency services, fire, police, whoever is involved in that community is aware of the messaging that you're putting out there. So as I mentioned prior, uh, LISOS works collaboratively with that same messaging. So that's why we uh, strongly encourage for folks, whether it's a community-based organization or a place of worship or, or, or whatever it, it is, that they are aligned with whatever the messaging in that local community is for um, disaster preparedness. Thank you. What areas is LISTOS active in, and how can an agency set up a LISTOS event? That's a great question. So in the state of California, we're in 19 counties, uh, the, the LISTOS program. And so we have 58 registered programs within those 19 counties. And the areas are all across, across the state, uh, from one corner of the state to the other corner of the state. So it includes the coastal areas, the valleys, everything is spread throughout um, California. And with Lisa California, the campaign, and I'm sorry, this is so confusing. <laughs> uh, for, the, for the campaign, it's resources that have been given to 24 primary counties 
in this last um, 18 to 20 months. Um, but then moving forward, um, we're at the, at the stage of really exploring. Uh, the governor has made it clear he wants this to continue. He wants ongoing funding of the Lisa California program, and we will be seeing the size of resource that we're given, whether it will remain the 50 million, will it go up so that we can serve all 58 counties. We'd love to see an expansion of Liliana's fantastic program. We'd like to see, you know, a lot of um, other great models that have, uh, you know, have been created this year to also be able to expand. I'm sorry, can you both restart your webcams? It looks like somebody accidentally uh, reset them. Are there, do you, do you each have any advice on adapting uh, this program for other populations or communities? Well, I, I can let you know that for the Lisa California campaign, you can just go to the site and go under Get Your Community Prepared, and it'll take you down to a toolkit that has all of our materials, everything from curriculums to materials um, of all these various guides, uh, videos. It has, you know, everything you could ever need. It's a kitchen sink. And then you can go ahead, take those materials, decide how do those need to be edited or changed to be applicable in, you know, Chicago or wherever you may be, right? Um, and we welcome that. We, we found, you know, I know that when we were doing some early inventory that many community members, especially diverse and vulnerable, could not afford to become prepared because they would have to pay to be prepared. So what we're really into is offering, just as Liliana does with her wonderful free approach, we want materials to be accessible and free to the, to the public. So feel free, other states, other, other countries, to take these materials and edit them so they reflect how um, preparedness would work in your community. Um, but we're, we're fine with that. Okay. And if uh, I can we're... add, I'm sorry, if I could just add that um, with, the, with the Least Coast program, right, you can utilize these these tools, these guides, or, or, or whatever it is you would like to implement, but then we can really assist you in, in, in building these partnerships so it's sustained in these communities, right? Because sometimes it's not just enough to give them, but what to do with that information, right? So I think that's where we kind of take the torch and then run with it. Um, and I think that's the, the beauty of the partnership where uh, uh, LISOS, the program, works collaboratively with least of the campaign. And so I, I strongly believe that um, you, you, once you give this, in, this educational, uh, to, this education to your communities, then just fostering those relationships and what are you going to do now with all of this? Thank you. Can you maybe just uh, explain a little bit more about how Listos is different from CERT in Spanish? Sure. I can, I can absolutely do that. I also am a, a CERT instructor, and I've been for almost a decade. And it's different because the Community Emergency Response Team is uh, precisely that. You're becoming responders in your community. So um, the LISOS is just the information and education at home. So it, it starts with you and I, and that's where LISOS the program comes in. Um, we're not um, training them to be emergency responders. We're not training them to be anything like this. We're just providing education resources and tools for them to be a more resilient uh, a family in the case of a disaster. So that's where the difference is. But it is the stepping stone for CERT. We do see that uh, folks that have gone through the Least Coast program then want to continue with their preparedness efforts and then are engaged in, in, in other trainings such as CERT or other, uh, even AmeriCorps or any other trainings of this sort. And, I, and, and if I can, I would, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I also just have to, to put in a word that um, the CERT training is now available online for 16 hours of the training um, in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Um, that's uh, being rolled out here in California. 
So I, I was just thinking about this a little bit, you know, from a, a Region 2 perspective. Um, so a, a least dose uh, individual may then choose to become a CERT. Um, it's, it's kind of an, an expansion on what they're doing, but it wouldn't be typical that it would be the other way around. However, in Region 2, we have made some recommendations and have developed some programming so that CERTs can do some of this blue sky work. So when they're not being deployed, when there aren't major of them, um, they can go into their communities and they can talk to individuals and families about how to be better prepared. Can you, can you tell our audience how LISTOS events are funded? Sure. So um, this is funding that was made available with some funds that were left over, if you will, from, from the Brown administration, and that Governor Newsom decided to really dedicate to making more of an investment in preparedness. So that was the initial $50 million that was given. Um, and then, as I said, then we ran, ran a grant process, a competitive process, that funded programs like LISOS, the program. It funded 57 CERT um, programs as well. Um, it funded AeroCorps. It funded um, different elements of the campaign, as well as these 300 um, nonprofits that are all part of the same effort, um, kind of going about it, you know, somewhat differently. Um, so, so that was that initial 18-month funding that got an extension by a few months. Um, we are now in the process during what's called the May Revise. Um, we will be getting um, a number that will inform what will that investment look like going forward. And it will be funded out of Cal OES, the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, will be the, um, the, the funded entity. Um, that will receive those funds, and then we will, again, run competitive processes to, to get this money out into the community. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. You bet. Can you, can you tell us if you've done this program in East LA, and if not, uh, when you might be planning to, and our, our, our uh, attendees said muchas gracias. Okay, yeah. Um, Yes, yeah, sorry, Karen. Yes, um, we do have a program in uh, uh, Los Angeles County, and so if you are interested, specifically if it's in your area, you can send us an email or go to our uh, website, and we're happy to uh, assist you if you want to implement the program in East LA. We will definitely support you to do that. And then, if you're interested in just materials, if you will, getting into the hands of people in East LA from the campaign, we had a partnership during this whole um, process with the American Red Cross that was in LA um, working in 30 very, very diverse and vulnerable pockets throughout Los Angeles that was able to get this material out on the street um, as they did their other um, program like the, the, the Pillowcase Pro Project and um, other um, preparedness approaches that they use, they then added ours to the mix. And so that was able to get out to um, members of the LA community. Thank you. How can other agencies recreate the hazard vulnerability maps in their own region? Um, I think the easiest thing to do is um, go, go grab ours and <laughs> Go grab uh, the name of our professor from Sac State, who did it here for California. Find out what you know, what his, is his department, and what colleague might he know about in your region, or would he be able to do it for you? Um, he was able to grab information um, and and do that that merge that was was so important and so critical. Um, you can also just contact universities that you, where you already have you know, relationships that do great GIS mapping. Um, I mean, you use census data, um, use information from Cal OES about uh, the um, earthquake zones, flooding zones, uh, et cetera. So that's how, how he did it. But um, it could certainly be reproduced in other communities. 
Thanks. Do Listos trainees deploy? No, they do not. They can be a resource within the community to bridge uh, the, a communication gap or for extending the message of preparedness uh, or any local uh, activities that you'd like to extend. But no, the idea is that we want to encourage them to become CERT training. We want to encourage them to be more involved in their community. So this is just a stepping stone. And we try to, with, when, we, when I talk about linking them to other resources, we introduce them to the CERT program in their local area, to their police activities league, or whatever it is that's very uh, um, present in their community, and we encourage them to, to be further trained. And so at this level, we do not um, train them for that. Thanks. Can you remind our listeners where they can get the disaster guide for homeless that you spoke about earlier, Karen? Sure. Disaster guide for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, this, this is found just like with all guides um, at LisosCalifornia.org website. Um, so if you just go to that website into prepare your community and you just scroll down, you'll find it there or at the very bottom of the entire website, we have on the right side materials that have to do with the homelessness initiative, farm worker initiative, social bridging. Um, these are some other like sub programs of the efforts that included creating county, um, county specific disaster directories so that um, our social bridgers could call people proactively and get them ready for fires, get them ready uh, for whatever disaster was coming their way, COVID information, et cetera. And so those guides are also, um, I think, a great model that you can steal and <laughs> hopefully copy and find helpful in your community. So there's just some really good stuff on there. No greater compliment than plagiarism, right? No, you just don't, I mean, literally, <laughs> just, just go for it. We, we, we want uh, more people to be prepared. That, that exactly. Is, yeah. How can you build on social media outreach with immigrant populations? What suggestions do you have to build the AIR community further? What we found um, works is you have to have material that has been kind of culturally curated very intentionally. Right, um, uh, and I'm I'm somebody who does not speak Spanish, knew little to nothing about the community, and have learned things like um, the importance of using culturally relevant, whether it's games, symbols, celebrities. We had a whole series called Informa Gente, which is a conversation between a um, a Latino um, celebrity and Dr. Ghali, our head of CDPH. And it was a just like a, this really lively banter back and forth done in both English and in Spanish. Conversations like that that would be put online um, would help us build our, our, our base. Also, um, the game, the Lataria, which is like a bingo, um, as I understand, in, in the community, we use that as a base of some artwork that we designed that instead of having your traditional Lotteria cards, they were the stages of disaster preparedness. And we created billboards in that. So there were all of these various um, kind of culturally relevant messages that I could not tell you because I'm not of, of that community, but all you had to do is connect with people from the community to find out what would really, um, you know, grab people, what's the right message, what mattered, and also be really sensitive to different generations, different income levels. We, we, we were providing everything from materials that hopefully was helpful for food and agriculture workers, you know, to people that were working in the entertainment industry, you know, and everything in between. So, so that's an, another thing that you, you really have to be mindful of, like, who is your target? What, what information are they going to find and, and what influencers are they going to find of interest? Um, 
we did an interesting campaign with Dia de, de los Muertos, like that was really interesting about how you can make your own altar. Um, I mean, we, there was all kinds of things that, that I seriously before this year would never have known about um, if not for this campaign and talking to those advisors. You need advisors, if, if you're like me, and, and uh, I say this with great humility, here I am a white lady, what the heck do I know about really reaching diverse communities? The only thing I know is that it has to be done smart, it has to be done with respect, it has to be done with people from the community leading the effort, and our job is to provide the resources. Let them lead. Liliana knows exactly how to grow her program. She just needs me to give her money. And that's what we need to do and stay out of the way. I bet she would agree with that. <laughs> and actually, Karen, that leads us perfectly into our, our last question, which I, I am combining into both. And I know we're kind of at time, but um, neighborhood community councils, can they apply for that grant funding? And we also had a question as to whether or not there would be uh, more grants available for folks to apply. Um, we're working out the, um, the whole Lisa California campaigns as we speak. Um, so um, I don't have the, the grants um, information at this time, but hopefully we'll have it by the end of May, early June. So can I ask you if, if the state was interested, are you using federal funds? Like are you using money from the EMPG grant or HGSP grant um, to fund these programs? 100% um, of these funds, all 50 million came specifically from state funds. And they were 100% given to nonprofit organizations. Wow. Well, kudos to you all. You guys are doing an amazing job. Everybody really appreciated uh, today's information. I would ask our listeners if they would take a moment to fill out our very short three-question poll. I would also remind folks that today's presentation, that there's a PDF in the download pod. You're welcome to download it now. Karen and Lillian both provided their information. I'm sure they wouldn't mind if there were additional questions if you were to reach out to them. What you see on our screen right now are some of the webinars we have coming up. Healthy Meal Plan for Emergencies, that's in English and Spanish. We have a couple of uh, webinars coming up with New Jersey's Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, their Virtual houses, uh, House of Worship Security Program coming up. All of those links are live um, and you can click on them and for the sake of time, I'm just going to go to the last slide so all of our upcoming webinars can be found at the first link. All of our previous webinars have been recorded and can be found at the second link. Today's webinar has been recorded and it will be available in about two weeks' time on the FEMA.gov and on the FEMA Region 2 site. If you don't already get our emails and you'd like to sign up, please subscribe. And if you have any questions, comments, suggestions for future webinars, please feel free to email us at FEMA-R2-Prepares at FEMA.DHS.gov. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our listeners. Thank you to our participants. 